I know you're going to dig this. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. Zooming in all the way from Columbus, Ohio, guitarist Craig McMullen, who played with the Curtis Mayfield Band from 1970 to 1973 and played as a musician on the 1972 soundtrack album, Superfly. Welcome and thank you for agreeing to be on our show. Hello, Craig. Good morning to you, Ms. McGlynn, and thank you very much for having me up here on the Funk Chronicle, F-U-N-K Chronicle. Well, we really are excited about this, and we let's, let's just get right in. You've had such a vast career, and you started when you were, how old were you when you got introduced to music? And, and take me up to the time uh, that you met and were with Curtis Mayfield. Okay, my career as a guitarist started when I was seven years old. I would go to Detroit to visit my aunt, which is my mother's sister. And my uncle, who I owe all the credit to as far as getting me started, and even my style to a certain degree. But his name was Jesse Willis. My aunt's name is Delore, and that's my mother's sister. I would go up there every summer to Detroit to visit. Well, when I was seven, my mom and myself, we went to Detroit and my aunt and my mother went to the store. At that time, my uncle, who drove for the, uh, what they call DSR, which is a bus driver for the city of Detroit, he also was playing guitar at that time. He never played professionally, but he taught himself how to read music and play the guitar. So at seven, he taught me how to play the song called Honky Tonk, which is made famous by Bill Dogger. Anyway, when my mom and my aunt come back, I was able to play that whole song. And so therefore, my interest of being a guitarist started at that point. So by the time I turned eight years old, which was like in November, my mom granted me the permission to go take lessons. And I say granted me because she had to pay for it, right? <laughs> but anyway, I didn't have my job then. Anyway, so uh, I started taking lessons. Then I'll skip all the way up to like, by the time I got to junior high school, and mind you, the great thing about taking the lessons was that I was able to read music. So we had a jazz band that performed once at junior high level. But now the real thing started when I went to high school, which was in the 10th grade, at Columbus East High School, which, you know, you guys being from Ohio, you know that East is known for winning championships in sports, et cetera, et cetera, basketball especially. But basically, they had a winning, or what you would call a championship type of jazz band. And we would enter the contest, and we would always, always win playing these uh, contests. Well, when I was in the 10th grade, my first year in high school, I made all city jazz band along with three other of my uh, schoolmates. Steve Barnett played bass, Leroy Savory played trumpet, and also the great Bobby Austin 
and he went on to play with Jack McDuff and other jazz groups. But we all made or were part of that particular all-star, all-city jazz orchestra, which was under the conduction of the great Doc Severson because the Ohio Music Education Association had a conference here in Columbus at that time, and we performed. Now, the good thing about that was that our conductor or our musical director is named Mr. Ted Turner. Now, Mr. Turner wrote out all original material and songs for our band to play. That's one reason why we always sounded somewhat different than most groups, uh, or excuse me, schools, they'll buy what they call stock arrangements, and then they go into that, and so therefore you can catch somebody playing the same stuff. Well, we were playing original stuff that was written out by Mr. Turner, and Doc Severson, like I said, he was a conductor. And so my career goes on. You're talking there. about, you're ta Craig, you're talking about the Doc Severson? Yes, the <laughs> Doc Severson from the Johnny Carson Tonight Show. All right. So I was, like I said, I had the pleasure of being under his conducting at that time. Speaking of which, I'm going to throw this in right quick, which is a little bit fast forward. But as my career progressed, I was fortunate, fortunate to play on The Tonight Show twice, in which I would run into Doc Severson at that time. And ironically, I had a picture of the Doc Severson that everybody else would know I was dressing hip as I don't know what and really like slick, what they call slick. Well, this was back when the little crew cut and little skinny tie stuff. And so I passed it around to the band members and everybody was laughing. And he comes in wanting to know, well, what are you guys laughing about? And so they pass him the picture. He immediately looked over at me. And one thing I can say about him, that Doc, he never forgot that he was the conductor for that band back in 1963. And he loved as a musician, Mr. Ted Turner. He always asked about him. So that was a little jovial thing. But now I'll get back to going from after high school. I graduated when I was 17. Bobby Austin, the other trumpet player that I spoke of earlier that was in the All City Band and at my high school, he had already gone to Berkeley College of Music, which all those that don't know, Berkeley College of Music probably will be considered the best school for jazz. Basically, it was a jazz oriented college at that time. And still, it turns out, if you look at the resume of all the great players in music that went to Berkeley, it's just a, a crazy amount of uh, talent that came from that particular thing. I only stayed there one year. But Berkeley's um, in Boston. Berkeley's in Boston. Yes, sorry, Berkeley and Boston, yes. And um, I only stayed one year. And I didn't like Boston. I love Berkeley, nothing wrong with Berkeley. It was just at that time, when you're talking about 1965, 66, the racial climate in Boston was terrible. I may as well have been in Mississippi or something. And I'm telling the truth on this. But anyway, I couldn't really get with that. Being young at 17, you're away from the great state of Ohio, you know how we Buckeyes are, you know. It was just different. So I came back after the year, and then I just started, I was always playing in local bands and stuff. So that takes me up to the point where one of the bands I was playing with was called the Enchanted Five, and they were just like the Temptations. It was like Columbus's version of the Temptations. They had the step, they had the tailor-made suits, the whole nine yards. We would also team up, and this is when I met the original Howl players, the Sax, Pee Wee, and my great friend, Sugarfoot, you know, Marshall, and I believe Greg was playing drums at that particular time. This is before they actually added, excuse me, added keyboard. But we would always play together, either in Columbus at a club or down at the now defunct Ebony Club down on Third Street, which you guys probably already know about. Maybe you always went there too also. Probably. But we played together like that. So it was like Sugar would step down and the rest of the band would accompany me behind the other singers. So we did that for a while. Then later on, I end up going into an apprenticeship program. Now, the reason I bring this up is because the Urban League had a drive to put blacks into the International Electrical Brotherhood Workers 
I might be saying that wrong, but anyway. Um, so a guy named Lemuel Sherrill and myself were actually the first two black that were ever in, allowed to be in the electrical union as printers. At printer, excuse me. What year was and that? So, that would be around about 1967, 68. Okay, and you know how long electricity has been around and the, the fact that we were the first two, they use the word men of color, but I'm just saying we were the first two blacks that they allowed, and I say allowed, to be a part of their apprenticeship program. Well, I was still playing, matter of fact, I remember coming from Dayton playing at the Ebony Club or something, I got good grades in the apprenticeship part of my schooling, but I was not always a 40 hour a week guy, which you can imagine playing at night and trying to make it to the job the next day, especially this was straight up construction where I'm building buildings and stuff like that. Make a long story short, they had to let me go, which means I got fired. So I went back to the first. How long did you last school. in the program, Craig? How long did you last? Uh, probably a little bit over a year. Okay, and, and, and what about the other gentleman? Did he, did he, he finish? He continued on, a Lemuel Sherrill, he continued, he got his journeyman's license, he even had his own company after a while. Okay. Lemuel Sherrill is his name. So he was successful, so they got one out of two. So I, that's not bad. That's 50%. But, yeah, but back to, uh, I always wanted to be a musician. So the director of the Urban League at that time his name, um, I'll say it in a minute, Mr. Laurie. He um, told me, and this is important, he told me, he said, you disappoint us. You and Lemuel were the first two blacks that they ever let in, and you messed up. So what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I'm going to be a musician like I'm supposed to be. I went to college for music. so." I'm not going to change. I'm making money playing out here anyway. So I'm just going to continue and take it as far as I can. And he said to me, you are never going to be nothing as a musician. You're never going to be nothing as a musician. You just messed yourself up. And you're very disappointing to us because of that. Now, those are true words. So I remember that. And then after that, I'll fast forward a little bit. I end up hooking up, excuse me, I end up getting with the impression. The way I got with the impressions is through Andre Fisher, who everybody knows as a drummer with Rufus and also married Natalie Cohen, which they won Grammy for Album of the Year, inseparable. But anyway, back to Andre and I were like what you call child buddies or young, young men buddies, <laughs> I would say. But he was originally from Los Angeles and he came here with a group called the Exit. They had a little hit out, local hit rather. And as most bands do back in those days, somewhere along the line when they're on the road, they end up disbanding because of whatever their management is or it just wasn't always put together correctly for them. So he started living here in Columbus and we would play at the jam session. He became a house drummer for the uh, uh, J.C. Davis, which was at the bottoms up. Just like Dayton, Columbus had several clubs in which you could see the top stars, like the Jamaica Club. You can always see I can Tina Turner's bus out there in the late 50s, and et cetera, et cetera, and all those. And then the bottoms up was most famous because you could see people like the OJs, you know, the Ohio players. Uh, and I also played out there with the Enchanted uh, Five. But it was known for having, like you call, national black R&B artists there. So he was in the house band there. And he and I always played, but see, he could play jazz. And with my background of playing jazz from going to uh, Berkeley, which I went also with a saxophone player named Mike Locke, we would go to the jam session. And at that time, the band that Bobby Austin and Mike Locke and I had in Boston was at that time an uh, avant-garde, the free jazz playing, which you hear Coltrane and Eric Dolphy and other people like that. Arnett Coleman, people like that playing what you call the free jazz. But our stuff was still based like some of the train stuff, uh, based on modo stuff, which is minor. So we knew at that time that when we started to play these tunes, we would put a funk beat in front of it. 
Now this is important only because when you think of fusion and you think of Bitches Brew, that's the name, I'm not cussing, it's the name of this album by Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, they kind of consider that to be the forerunner of what you call fusion, which was mixing the backbeat with uh, jazz head or somewhat jazz feel. Well, I'm not saying that we were playing it before Bitches Brew came out. Technically, we were playing that way before Bitches Brew actually got released, but I'm not trying to take credit for being the first ones to do what they call fusion. But I'm just saying that's the chronological order that things went in. So basically, I'm just saying that that was important because it bonded our friendship even more. And when Andre had a chance, he left Columbus and went to San Francisco to do a play, Big Time Buck White is the name of the play. But anyway, the Impressions were looking for a drummer and they were on the West Coast. He joined the Impressions. And so therefore, as young guys, we always made that bond. One day, we're going to play together on the big stage, man. Don't worry, we're going we're gonna to make it. Well, when time came for Curtis Mayfield and the Impressions, which is the Impressions at that time, it didn't have Curtis Mayfield's name up in front. It was the Impressions. Uh, Andre told Curtis about me. They sent me a plane ticket. I went to Chicago to audition. Naturally, I aced it. And that's how I got in with the impression, which was Curtis Mayfield, Fred Cash, and also Sam Gooden. Impressions that everybody really realizes uh, without Jerry Butler and um, the other two that came from Chattanooga. So it was a, the three piece impression. And now I'll fast forward a little bit. So Curtis, after about a year or so, Curtis decided he was going to step down from the impression because he had already cut the album Curtis as a solo artist. And he was going to step down to run Kurt Tom Records and be more involved with that. And what ended up happening is that Leroy Hudson was selected to take Curtis's place in the impression. Well, by this time, Andre Fisher had been playing with a group, a local group called Ask. Rufus, which everybody knows is the original Rufus band. Now, Craig, is this happening in Chicago or is this happening in California? No, no this is all happening in Chicago. Okay. Right, in Chicago. Now, the importance of this, well, I shouldn't say importance, but in other states, the importance of this is that uh, the original Rufus band didn't have Shaka in it at Shaka time. They didn't have Shaka in it at first. Paulette McWilliams, who went on the same background, with um, Luther Vandross, she was the vocalist and Charlie Colbert was the male black vocalist and the other guys were white. Not that that means anything, I'm just clarifying, you know. So Charlie also was a business guy that had a lot of accounts. In other words, he had advertisement accounts in the city of Chicago. So I would be up there and I would record with the Rufus Band commercials the radio and TV commercial for AMP, Sears, or whatever account he might have had. And so when it came time for them to go to Los Angeles, he chose to stay in Chicago and let the band go on with the newly acquired Chaka Khan. The rest is history, as everybody knows from me. Now I'll go up and say that now I'm playing with Curtis. He decides he's going to go out and record Curtis live album and but before that we were doing solo gigs because like I said before the album Curtis started to do so good that it was what they call forced him to come out and what they would call back the album up by personal appearances so in doing so Andre was still with us with the first Curtis Mayfield band which was Andre Fisher on drums myself on guitar the addition of Master Henry Gibson on percussion, who was the best, well, I shouldn't say the best, he's in the Guinness Book of Records as being the most recorded percussion player. So he, that makes him kind of good. But anyway, all the percussion stuff that you heard out of Chicago generally had Master Henry on it. Anyway, uh, Lucky Scott, who was Sam Gooden's nephew, he was the bass player. So that rounded out the very first, which is technically the actual the impressions band 
without the keyboard. So we fast forward from there, and then Curtis decides he's going to go and cut a live album. By this time, the deal for Andre and Rufus panned out, so he ended up going to Los Angeles. So he was replaced by the drummer named Tyrone McCullum, who's out of Chattanooga. Uh, remember now the uh, the uh, impression, most of them, or I put it like this, out of the five, which would be Jerry Butler and Curry, they were from Chicago. But the the Brooks brothers and uh, Sam Gooden, they were out of Chattanooga. So that's the, uh, for your precious love, that's who you actually hear singing on that first thing. But let me keep going. So we end up doing the very first Curtis Live album, which happened to be, it wasn't our first gig, but it was definitely a surprise because it was the first gig using Tyrone as a drummer. And I say to Curtis, well, we gonna cut the first gig we doing as a live album? And he said, yeah. So that became that. Now I'm gonna reach for that particular album. Bear with me here. Okay. Uh, and uh, see, you're showing the CD, and I have the LP. <laughs> okay. So if you hey, since you want to be like that. All right, now that's the backup. Yeah, there's there's of it. a lot of pictures right there, and Miss Lynn, she has Miss Lynn, she has the actual album she said, which I'm moving a little, I'll make it make my, so I won't be jerking for you. This is what Miss McLean had. <laughs> you know, Curtis Live album. Yes. And like I said, it has our pictures on it. Now, the good thing about it is it has our pictures on it. The other part about it is it's a two album set, as you know. And technically, there are some great songs on here that are definitely great message songs like We People Who Are Darkened and Blue, Stare and Stare, I Plan to Stay a Believer, and the other things on it. Everybody can check it out still. It's, it's, it's available. <laughs> but anyway, so that was the very first album that we did. Now, after that became successful, we're still touring around. Then Curtis ends up, he turned around and um, we cut the album Roots, which was the second actual album that Curtis did. It would be the third album for him, but for us as a band, it would be our second album that we did with Curtis. And this is all prior to, one second, not moving too fast again. So this is the Roots CD right here. It has some great songs on it. Out of this one especially became a song that was very popular, especially called We Got to Have Peace and so forth. Okay, now we fast forward a little bit more. Now the next album coming up, after we did a lot of touring and stuff like that, would be Curtis's Superfly album, in which he was contacted by the producers there to do this particular soundtrack. Now, mind you, Isaac Hayes had already made a big splash with Shaft which showed that black artists can do soundtracks that can relate to the actual movie and propel them to gross a lot of money, I guess you would say. But ironically, Superfly outgrossed the movie. But one thing about Superfly, Superfly was released about, I'd say about 11 months prior to the release of the actual movie Superfly. Uh, let me jump back a little bit. So the first song that we as a band did was our cameo appearance in the movie Superfly, the club scene, in which we cut Pusher Man. That was the very first song that we did. We did it the night before. We went into the uh, club scene where they were filming the next day and did our cameo appearance for that particular scene. Then we were off to Europe. Uh, we did not start to cut any more stuff on Superfly until after we came back from our European tour, which happened to be maybe about three or four months later. The rest of the album soundtrack that you hear for Superfly was cut in Chicago, 
And the drummer at that time on that whole album, except for Pusha Man, is named Morris Jenny. So you still have Curtis, myself, Joseph Lucky Scott on bass, the Master Henry Gibson, and on a couple of the songs, we have the great, my buddy, Phil Upchurch playing guitar also. Like if you hear on Superfly, where you hear that volume pedal thing, you know, like that. Not the wah wah sound, but just what the, what the guitar player calls a volume pedal sound. Anyway, that's Phil doing that. Now, I am the only one that play, and I'm saying, I'm not trying to be like, oh yeah, okay. No, technically, I'm the only guitarist that plays on every cut. And I only say that because I'm proud of the fact that Freddie's Dead, which is Curtis's best or number one grossing single, there's only one guitar player on there, and that's me doing my wah wah stuff. And then you have Master Henry Gibson and Lucky Scott and Morris Jennings as the rhythm section, along with the keyboard players and the whole orchestra. Let me give credit to Johnny Pace, who did all the arrangements. And the reason I say all the arrangements is because there was controversy about Johnny and Curtis and this and that. And maybe people that are a little older, they might remember there was going to be a lawsuit, but Johnny decided he wasn't going to go that route. And he'll just say, forget it. Now, mind you, Johnny Pate was the impression of Ranger for years and years. So like, it's almost like Curtis and Johnny like brothers. So now these two brothers having a little spat about something. And technically, and I'll be honest, it was about getting his right for Junkie's Chase. Now, what I'm trying to say is this. And this is very important for all those out there in the music world, that Johnny Pate, that was his original composition and arrangement. All he wanted was just to have his credit for that. And through whatever means, and I'm not going to get into it like that, but I've got to tell the truth while I'm up here because the funk chronicles would not be right unless everybody told the truth about the funk. And this is part of the funk that you need to know about. So anyway, my point being is that that's what I call getting cheated of what you did. But that's the way the music game goes sometimes. So I just want to make that clear that Johnny Tate was the ranger of everything. And Curtis might have hummed something, maybe. But to be honest with you, and anybody that's taken any theory and do it, done any arrangement, you know when you got a full orchestra and you start harmonizing all those different notes and writing that stuff down. For the person that did not read music, I don't think you're going to take that kind of credit. I mean, not saying that you couldn't hum something and everybody writes it down from there. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying give credit where credit is due. It doesn't hurt anything. But the reason I say that is because if you look at the album, it'll say something different, like written down from the original dictation. Now, everybody knows what dictation is. And dictation means like you're saying something and somebody else is writing it down. Well, how can you write something down that you can't write? Nah, well, anyway, later for that. So let's go back to the good stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry. But after Superfly, which became, it grossed big, you know. The, I, I, I say this, on Jet Magazine cover, Curtis Mayfield, they said, he was on the cover of Jet Magazine, and said that Superfly grossed $20 million. But now when you look at the date of the Jet Magazine and you look at the date of the release of the movie Superfly, you can see that within 11 months and so many weeks, Superfly album was already out, which means that if they printed that and that be correct, that means that Superfly grossed over $20 million back in 1972 in less than a year. Put that money up against what's money nowadays. That's that's a lot of money. You know, maybe I should have gave us a couple million so we wouldn't have to pay them the taxes. I would have taken it anyway. So, uh, but Superfly had become one of the, well, it's got to be the greatest album that I've played on, the most rewarding 
album, and I say that because of monetizing and the fact that a lot of the songs from Superfly are in movies. I presently, as a musician, fortunately, as a musician, have done a lot of recording, but the union keeps track of stuff. So now when we have today where a lot of the soundtrack that you hear are taken from old, what they call old school music or old R&B stuff and put into these movies. Well, according to the AFM contract music, et cetera, et cetera, we get a piece of that money all the time. So currently I'm fortunate to have over 23 movies not all of them are from Superfly, but you know, like Roll Bounce, which is Boogie Fever, you know, um, I get stuff from that. So basically, commercial, any of the TV shows, all of that, as uh, what they call non performing musicians. When I say performing, in other words, I'm not singing, but you get a little piece of the acting. So, in other words, instead of buying a big building for the Funk Chronicles to be housed as a museum, and paying off David mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. I only get to take you and David out to McDonald's and we can enjoy two or three milkshakes with no problems in my check. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, 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 got a, I got a picture of that. Now, also, let, let, let's, uh, when we think about the, um, <clears throat> the Curtis Mayfield band, how many members of the original <clears throat> Since you became a, became a part of it, how many members are left in that band? Technically, the only members that ever were in the band would have been, I'll just say for the drum part, would be Andre Fisher originally because we were with the impression. He still lives and we have done Curtis Mayfield tribute concerts in the past and we'll probably do some more. But basically, everybody that you saw in that picture is passed away, unfortunately. And so I don't, only time I get a chance to be with them is through video. So me being with the videos, there's plenty of videos out there of us playing, but I'm the only, what you call, living guitarist or member of that band right now that's still alive, outside of Andre. But I can say, I go into past what Andre did uh, and into the Superfly and, and all the other albums and so forth. Um, so I'm the only one. So if you want to hear the truth, make sure you get in touch with me and I'll tell you the truth. I won't bite my tongue. I'll tell the truth like that. <laughs> oh, I believe that. You know, <clears throat> as we, uh, I, I know that it came up as I was doing some research on you that sometimes they get Craig McMullen mixed up with, what, Tyrone McCullen. McCullen. And right. you know, it's so interesting, because I'm a McLean, is that uh, seeing black folks with Irish names. Yeah, McMullen, I think, is Scottish, but it's the same, <coughs> well, the same slave master, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. I, I agree with you. Yeah, they always get stuff mixed up. And ironically, uh, they spell it, actually they spell his name incorrectly, and they put the U-L-L-E-N on it. And that's why it looks like my name, M-C-M-U-L-L-E-N, because his last few uh, letters are the same as mine, but that's not how you spell McCullum anyway. But yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, because there was an article that I had read um, uh -huh. about you, and, and, that, and that was one of the things that they were talking about. And they also talked about, didn't you, um, there was another article where uh, you did some work about at, at a re for Aretha Franklin? Yes, uh -huh. I also, uh, I'll get back to my days. After I left playing with Curtis, I decided I wanted to go to California to be what they call this session musician guy. I wanted to play on other people's albums. So after having, I, I still was related to Kurt Tom Records, and et cetera, but I went to LA to live in which I had to start all over again. So I get to L.A. Oh, but what year is that, Craig? What, what year is that when you get to L.A.? That'll be about almost close to 1974. Okay. So technically, I was still playing with Curtis through 74. I mean, up until the first part of 74. And so I get there, and the impression 
with Leroy Hudson, I played with them for a hot minute. And then that's when I said I went back with Curtis. But point being is that Impressions got a whole band together with horns. Well, the trumpet player named Claude, can't think of his last name, but uh, Claude, he ended up playing, everybody was making that migration to Los Angeles at that time. Uh, so you had like a lot of the, mo actually like when Motown left to go to California, a lot of musicians end up trying to go there also. Uh, same thing out of Chicago. Everybody was migrating to the Sunshine State in Los Angeles. So Claude was there and we had seen Claude before because we were on the very first Midnight Special, which is the show that featured live performances of late night on Friday night, which would be technically midnight Saturday morning. Uh, that was the Midnight Special with Burt Sugarman with Wolfman Jack. And everybody used to tune in to see, and it was live, so it wasn't low tape stuff, none of that crap they're doing nowadays. It was straight up live playing. And um, so he was on there with uh, playing with Ike Turner, Ike and Tina Turner. So anyway, as I contact Claude to let him know I'm in town, he calls me back in a couple hours and wants to know, do I want to go to the studio because Ike wants to use me to play some recording work. Now, this is about three o'clock in the morning, and I had just flown into Los Angeles. So naturally, being the musician that I am, I don't care about the time. So he said, he'd come by and pick me up. So he come by and pick me up about 3.34. I go to the Bolick Sound, which is a tremendous, lovely studio Ike had, and I record whatever Ike wanted to do. And Ike paid me cash, no matter what y'all might try to make a joke about. He paid me in cash, okay? <laughs> anyway, so uh, that was my very first money-making job in Los Angeles. The rest of it is like, I called up different producers, arrangers, whoever, to get your name out there because I was not known and Los Angeles is a very, very clicky thing. And you have so many, uh, many musicians out there that have done a lot of work. So you're just like a cattle call almost, you know, but it's clicky. So I end up, playing with the Supreme as a road gig. Now in that particular time, Sherry Payne had taken Diana Ross's place and it was Mary Wilson, Cindy Birdsong, and Sherry Payne was the Supreme that I played behind. And I did that for a couple of years. After meeting James Gatson, who was a great, great drummer, session guy, Google James Gatson, that's all I can say. But anyway, James, was the sound of Bill Withers. So all the drum stuff you hear from Bill's earlier stuff was from James Gatson, who goes back to the Watch on and Third Street band, who, uh, he's legendary, trust me. Anyway, so I end up playing a couple gigs on the road with Bill Withers, but more importantly, I end up playing the Midnight Special, and you can Google the Midnight Special Bill Withers, and you can see me playing on there. I also end up doing the Tonight Show, Johnny Carson, which I also did with Aretha Franklin. Now, what happened with that, upon my introducing myself around Los Angeles, I end up meeting the great H.B. Barney, who's a tremendous arranger, producer, so forth and so on. And he was contacted to put a band together to back up Aretha Franklin. And that was my introduction to Aretha Franklin, which I was there for a couple of years. We also had the pleasure of playing on the road. We were using the great James Jameson playing bass with us. So it was like two legendary people like Aretha number one, and then James Jameson singing. The original sound of Motown, and everybody knows about Jameson, because if you're a bass player and you don't know about Jameson, you're not a bass player. Living, you must have died or something. Anyway, so, <laughs> But that was my introduction there. I also was able to play on Aretha Franklin's album called Sweet Passion. Now I'm gonna move slowly. Don't go nowhere. Uh -oh. Sorry about that. But we gotta make this all finished. This is the album here that I'm playing on with Aretha Franklin. So I've done about maybe three or four cuts in here. Now I didn't play on every song, but there's a lot of uh, songs on here that are 
It's a pretty great album. It, it wasn't like some of the other hits, but I, I have like that it. album. I have that album. Now, the, the thing that you said about spelling your name wrong, well, if you look down on some of the things like Metals of Springtime or I've Got the Music in Me, the jazz big band thing, my name is spelled incorrectly, but they did misspell it on the check. So I guess that's the most important thing. That is this the most is the important. This right here. And I'm glad that you say, sorry for moving so fast today, that you had that particular album. So I played with her. One other outstanding thing about playing with Aretha is that we were able to play for the inauguration of Jimmy Carter. And we performed two days there in Washington, D.C. One day was televised on TV, which you can go to YouTube and pull up inauguration Jimmy Carter, Aretha Franklin, you'll be able to see all four songs that we performed on that stage for the TV. Uh, so that's, you know, you can go there if you want to check that out. It's available now. And well, uh, I mean, well Craig, I mean, that that's, you know, to, to have that happen in your career. I mean, that's, we're talking about a uh, Jimmy Carter. He's still, he's still alive. And, right. and uh, I think sometimes people don't realize in those four years that he was president, he did a lot of things that we're still seeing today. And to, uh, for him to have reached out to have an Aretha Franklin at an inauguration and you be able to play there, that's not just something I think you just pass over. That is something to, to celebrate. I agree with you. That's like, to me, that's kind of like what you call monumental because how many times do you get a chance to play for the inauguration of a president. I mean, it might be a little bit more, well, you can see what happens now. They, she's done it more than just one president, but I put it like this. She didn't do it with me, except with Jimmy Carter. So that's my treasure right there. I was, I, I think that might've been her first uh, presidential inauguration performance. I might be wrong, but anyway, Aretha is, is what I consider the best all around singer. And what I say by that is that she can sing gospel with no problem. You saw her do classical as a fill-in before. Um, you also have her playing jazz stuff. The R&B definitely just so funky stuff, you know. So she was able to like cross and play almost anything. And she could play piano now. Don't don't sell her cheap on that. Now, I'm not saying that she could read music, but I am saying that she could play. I mean, she, if you looked at that uh, Mumbles, I got the music in me off that album, or you pull it up off of YouTube. Anything I mentioned, you could pull up off of YouTube to hear it. And she's playing like piano solos and certain things or on stage when we're playing. So I would consider her the greatest all around singer that I've ever performed with. And that's, I say that to be for no matter what the gender is, whether it be female or male. And I played with Marvin Gaye also. So um, I haven't played for too many, what you call, chump type of singers. They were all, I guess they were pretty good, you know. Yeah, okay. I didn't have to throw no shoe at them, right? <laughs> right, right. You know, one, right. Of the, one of the things I want to ask you is, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Well, what I'm doing now, I'm presently in school at Ohio, the Ohio State University, pursuing to get my BA in jazz studies. I've been there for a while, yeah, but I'm almost finished. Matter of fact, this summer, I'm taking one of my GCs in geology of national parks, which is one of my sciences that I have to take. But like I said, I'm almost finished with everything. I finished all of my jazz studies. You know how college is now, they want you to take all this other stuff. It's not gonna matter, but you gotta jump the rope that they provide for you and jump high enough so you don't mess up and so forth and so on. But that's what I'm doing. And also plan to continue. I'm still able to, like nowadays, people can record from their home, et cetera, et cetera. So I've done some things where I'm, people are sending me tracks and I'll go ahead and put my guitar on them and make money deals like that. Um, but basically that's what I'll end up doing. Now, as far as when I get this piece of paper, the thing that I like to do, and I, I was a tutor also, let me say this, I was a tutor, a student tutor 
for a subject called Rhythm and Blues Through Hip Hop, which was uh, created by Dr. Ted McDaniel. He's a brother that was up at Ohio State, but he's now retired. But at that time, I was tutoring the football players. And all the football players that you knew that came through Ohio State from, I'd say, uh, 2010, 11, 12, especially that undefeated year, I tutored these guys because they were taking that particular subject. And it wasn't that you had to be a music major. It's a non-music major type of subject. But they took it for what they call diversity. So um, all the guys that you see, some of them still playing pro ball right now, um, they are were my actual students, as I guess you could say. So I like the fact that I could teach and be able to talk, as you can tell. Um, I like that a little bit better than trying to teach guitar. Not that I couldn't, but I like the other fact of bringing history to everything. Um, like I say, I played on a lot of different albums, etc. cetera. Uh, I know we're talking about Superfly. I also want to bring to the uh, forefront the album by Donald Byrd called Places and Spaces. I'm sorry about that movement. Okay, Donald, Donald Bird. Yeah, That's jazz. Album, Donald Bird is jazz. Yes, um, this particular album went number one on Billboard. And uh, it is what you call the pre-runner of the word smooth jazz. Now, this is because it was crossing, excuse me for wiping myself, it was uh, considered if you look at what is called smooth jazz compared to stuff like that. And uh, that comes from Larry and Fonz Mizell, which I'll do this real fast. The uh, history behind me getting with them was through Leroy Hudson. Now, Leroy Hudson went to Howard University, and his roommate was Donnie Hathaway. So if you hear any similarities in the voices of Donnie Hathaway and Leroy Hudson, it's because, plus they co-wrote the ghetto. And uh, if you hear any similarities in their voices sometimes, it's because, hey, they were roommates for a long time. Also at Howard University at that time were Freddie Perrin and Barry and Fonz Mizell. Now, I was introduced to them through Leroy Hutt. Now, these guys were doing a lot of stuff. They were called the corporation. So uh, I want you back, ABC, all that stuff by the Jackson Five. And you see over there, writers, it's called the corporation. Technically, that's who they were. Larry and Fonz Mizell and Freddie Penn. So as they broke away from Motown, Freddie went to Capitol Records, and then the Mizell brothers went to Blue Note, and that's how I ended up doing um, Places and Spaces, which became the number one, Billboard's number one jazz category album in 1975. And also uh, Bobby Humphrey's Fancy Dancer album also did uh, Stanley Turrentine, everybody come on out and uh, move it slow here. Stanley Turbantine, <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Stanley Turrentine, a great saxophone player. Uh, we have our pictures on, on there also. And um, sorry for that fast movie. But so, so, so one of the things that you're, you're letting us know, Craig, is that you have such a uh, broad range of musical talent and, and and that's to be commended what i would like to ask you at this time is that your legacy uh and 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 your relationship to funk how would you explain that well my version of when you say the word funk it just means that the beat makes that body move but now, as far as, I'm not gonna get technical because you're not in school and I don't have to explain something to somebody. But technically speaking, although you could say, well, is Freddie's dead funk? Well, maybe not. But now if you go back to the album by Leroy Hudson, here I go slowly. This is called Spirit of 76, feel the spirit of brother. Now the song Butterfat on here, now that's definitely the funk that you're looking up, or you're talking about here. So I played on, a, 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 here's another funky one, uh, If It Don't Fit, Don't Force It by Kelly Patterson. I also played on that and that went gold. So those are some funk things that we want to put them under what we call funk categories. 
But other than that, all the music is related. But the great thing about the uh, Funk Music Hall of Fame is that through David and yourself, you're able to keep the legacy and understanding of that particular genre of black music. And it's so important that we keep that alive and so that people will understand where these, where these genres of music come from and how they all are related back to black music. And so, again, I'm not really answering your question, maybe, but I'm just saying that I got some funky stuff now, but it may not be the same way that maybe Lakeside or somebody is, but it, it'll work. It'll work one way or the other. Well, this is David Webb, the president and CEO of the Funk Center. You know, I'm so happy that you came out on our show. And, you know, just being in Columbus, Ohio, people don't know how the rich history like Dayton, how Columbus is, it has a little funky history up there. Can you t let the audience know about a little bit of your funk in Columbus, Ohio? Can you do that? Yes. In other words, like when you're talking about funk and you've had uh, Michael Beard was a drummer for the bar cave. Now they were just a little bit younger than me going to East High School. And so Frankie Thompson, the trombone player, and also Michael Beer were part of the great group, the bar cave, especially in their heyday. And then you also have the Morris Payne, which they call LA Sky, the first horn band that Rick James had all the horn players, Chris Powell, the Morris Payne, and I forgot the other trumpet player's name, they were all from Columbus East High School also. And so therefore you have several coming out of East High, again, coming out of East High School. And East High School is famous. I mean, you could go back to, and people that know their jazz history or their trumpet history, Harry Sweet Edison, he went to East High School. And so you also have the song Roland Kirk. I'm not for sure about the song going to school, but he's from Columbus, Nancy Wilson. But back to what you're saying about the funk, the bar cave and also the stuff with Rick James, all that has influence on the record from guys from what we call the 614 C, but Columbus, Ohio. And so give credit to those guys. Matter of fact, I think those guys have more gold records than me but I, I'm, I'm making that as a little joke, but they do have more on their wall than I do. But I'll just say this as a little thing, that back in the day, producers or record companies were not giving out gold records to musicians. Now I have a gold record for Boogie Fever by the Silver to Freddie Perrin, but in general, record companies and producers, I'm not gonna say they cheat, I'm not gonna say they unappreciative, but uh, I don't have nothing except one. <laughs> but I'm fortunate because I can still get, go to the mailbox and get paid a little bit of that, what I was telling you about that milkshake money for you and David. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm proud of the fact that even with the work that I've done in Superfly, although other things have transpired where I've gotten paid for, doing commercials, et cetera, et cetera. And it works because the musicians union uh, always had a contract. So you have a paper trail. And then as people started what you call sampling or taking the tracks and putting them in to movies. And the purpose of that was instead of paying an orchestra and also paying arrangers to do fresh music for all these different movies, they found it was easier to pull something off of a CD and insert it in to these movies. So I have to my credit like about 23, 24 movies that I get paid for, except for like Friday, um, other movies uh, that's out there. Cable, matter of fact, Cable Guy, which is weird because they use a mu music called Pusher Man and Jim Carrey Cable Guy. That's how far back it goes. Uh, the new Superfly 2018 used two songs. So whatever, that's how that works. And the sampling thing from, uh, I'll just say, uh, Tupac, um, excuse me, uh, Tupac Late Night. That's us playing Wind Parade from the Donald Byrd album that I showed you. Uh, when you go to The Joy by Kanye West and Jay-Z, they're using the music from the Curtis Maple Alive, The Makings of You. So in short, all the rappers, J. Cole, all these things, I get, again, this little, I call it French fry money. 
So we can get some French fry money from all these different rappers from Tupac, blah, 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 that have sampled Curtis Mayfield music, et cetera. And that's the one good thing, especially at my young age, and you're not going to be out here playing all the time like, like you w might want to, but you can still have some type of income coming in, being blessed from the uh, music that you created and recorded from the past. And I like that part of it. But they're not, they're not out of the woods yet. There's a lot of stuff that they need to correct on it, and they're working on it, and I'm making sure that they work on it because I need mine, as they say. <laughs> Uh, it, let me ask you this, that um, it, since your span of your musical career, how have you seen the music industry change? The good part and maybe some of the bad part. What, 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 uh, when we look at music at today and from where you began, what have you seen? Well, I think if, uh, the change in what I call the music probably began back in uh, either the late 70s or early 80s, maybe even mid 80s, when the introduction of the drum machine came into play. Like the Lynn drum machine, or I have an old Oppenheimer drum machine, but we'll just say the Lynn machine, the Roland uh, 808 that you hear on a lot of rap stuff. Once the idea was that one person, and generally in the beginning, it was the keyboard players who had all the, what they call sequencing abilities, because either the keyboard was built with sequences in it, where they could play certain parts and put it in themselves. Now, what ended up happening is that you don't get the realistic big sound, just like if you listen to Philadelphia International, uh, any of that stuff like that, that big sound, even the early Motown sound, and a lot of that was cut on eight track. You hear these big, good, what you call analog, good sound. Now all you hear is this little high top end stuff, and that's from, from the digital stuff. But that's what I call end up being the downfall of creative music as a whole, because you don't have any other personality. And mind you, the Roland Company, the 808, they never got a Grammy, but you can hear them on everything that the rappers do almost, so forth and so on. So now that's changed to the point where you don't need to have a whole orchestra, but that's not necessarily true. I think that the sound of the big orchestra, or it doesn't have to be a big orchestra, but just a full live musician being recorded now, that it means a little bit more to the track. In other words, put up those tracks against, or Frankie Beverly tracks, put it up against uh, Amigos or somebody like that, and see how the difference of the music sounds, etc. And so now, one thing that didn't change is like over in Europe or in rock and roll, they still record with what they call live musicians. They're not using so much drum machine. So it's only in our black music that we've chosen to go this particular route. And unfortunately, the young rappers, and I'm not knocking them, but they don't have the musical knowledge to take what they're doing and take it to another level. So that's why you hear, that's why, why you think that they turn around and they don't pick out a lot of rap songs to put on these commercials. They don't pick out a lot of rap songs to put in movies. They turn around and go back and get what we call the old school music and they drop them in because it has more substance to it. That's not to knock the rappers, but it's not their fault too. I'll put it like this to their defense that when I was coming up and I was in the sixth grade, you could go to the music room and pick out whatever instrument you wanted and Generally, you could be taught from elementary school and if you carry it on. Now, what happens is, fast forward, the rappers of the day with their young age, they barely have marching bands in school. So you don't have that creativeness and the ability to learn. So if you don't know much, you can't do much. So they know how to work a machine, and that's where they're at right there. But they always want to sample. So that's how I end up getting in with the uh, musicians special payments fund which plays for the most of the rap stuff that they uh, do, so a sample that is. So that's where that comes in at because they don't have the ability to even play. In other words, like they could learn, if they knew how to play or somebody could play, they could play that particular sound that they hear and then they wouldn't have to use sampled pre-recorded music. But that's not the case. Thank goodness it's not the case so I can still give a little bit of mine while we go on. But that's to their defense, it's not their fault. We as a people have taken away 
our sensitivity to the art form, whether it be in painting, music, or whatever, we've kind of like turned a blind eye to that stuff, taken it out of the school system, number one. Not that they don't have music in school, but it's not like it was before. And that's where you come into the problem, that you can't generate new things because there's no outlet for those, for the rappers or the young people, I should say, to actually learn. Not that they don't learn, some of them still do, but for the general, it's like, oh, I can buy this machine and I can do this. But they don't even understand a lot of the stuff that they put in there is out of key with whatever the other track is, but they don't care, they just do it. And it gets over. And so the lust for uh, music companies to put out stuff, regardless of what it is, to make, excuse me, to make the money, this is where they're coming from. And um, I'm not going to knock anything. It's just the way it is. And we just have to make our adjustments. Well, the things will, should be better. But in the meantime, I'm still available when y'all want some real guitar stuff put on your tracks. You know? um, I'll, I'll still be able to negotiate with you and we can get your stuff up and running. <laughs> That's a plug, right? Uh, of course it is. Uh, my, my final question, my final question to you, Craig, is mm -hmm. <clears throat> why do you think that the, the Funk Music Hall of Fame is important for us to continue in this vein? Uh, again, I, I believe that the job that you and David are doing, it, we have, just like you have a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you need to have a Funk music hall of fame which is what you're trying to keep doing because that way people can come back because i think i read where like dayton has the most funk bands with the most million sellers etc cetera, etc cetera. so like you say if you check out the music and you go through ohio from the oj to me with superfly and down there with ohio players you know lakeside all the other slave, all that stuff like that. Then you go to Cincinnati, you get Bootsy, Midnight Star. I mean, Ohio is Ohio is just straight up funky. Now let me also um, say this: that the bass player, the great Chuck Rainey, who everybody knows just like they should know James Jameson, the great Chuck Rainey is the one who's playing on the Places and Spaces album I've done, the um, Bobby Humphrey album I've done, Fancy Dancer, and other things, and he has. Oh man, he's like James um, James Gatchett. They've played on a hundred of million sellers. But again, he's from Cleveland. So again, the Buckeyes, all of us, we setting the stage up. So now when you talk about the Funk Music Hall of Fame, this is important because you can't get no closer to the origin than right here in Ohio. And with the work that you guys are doing, it helps to bring about the fact that at any point, the young white kids, the young Asian kids, the young whatever, they want to learn. Now they have some places they can go to and really learn about it because you can't expect that Ohio, I'm not going to say Ohio State, but I'll say Ohio State as a clue. You can't expect them to put a whole course on nothing but funk music. Although they touched upon it, don't get me wrong, in my classes they touched upon it. But again, the Funk Music Hall of Fame has to be there to keep this legacy because this is black music and the funk is what the music to make the body move, et cetera, make you feel good, et cetera. James Brown, I mean, James Brown wasn't from Ohio, but look where he recorded at. So, I mean, this is all important for us because we have to have a legacy of keeping our own history because we go back from Louis Armstrong and back in the days of Congo Square when they were dropping the slaves off and they had used Congo Square only as once a week the slave owners would allow the black slave captives to party, so to say. And this is, I'm, I'm not going to get in that because now we're getting ready to get into the beginning of jazz, et cetera, et cetera. We'll save that for another um, conversation. But all that has its relativity in regards to where our music comes from, how we can keep it alive, and what we should do to keep it alive. And you guys are doing a great job. And uh, I appreciate the fact that you guys let me become a part of this recording to say my little piece, et cetera, et cetera. And again, like I say, 
it's been a pleasure. I don't know if we're about ready to wrap up, but it's been a pleasure. But again, the thing that really got me over, I'm gonna move slow here. Here we go. This is the one that has propelled me to all these other things. Curtis right? Mayfield, Superfly. Superfly. Now remember everybody, this was technically not about glorifying drugs, but listen to some of these words, or listen to any of the words that Curtis says, and you'll see that he was anti-drug, but he also was a realist, and he was telling you in song what's going to happen, just like he's done in other songs that he's had, you know. But the music from this, I've gotten what I call my check, mostly from music from here. And uh, so I can appreciate that. Move slow. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Craig. I really have enjoyed and appreciated the information that you have shared with us today. Wish you the best, and uh, we'll stay in tow. And if you have some memorabilia you want to share with the Funk Museum, we will definitely welcome it, and David will follow up with you. And right. this is Ryan McLinn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Centers award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, keep it funky, funky, funky. Places and spaces I've been.